Iron Man 3 is that one relative that you definitely recognize at the family reunion, but you're not sure who they're related to. Like, yeah, the films go Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, but the film feels more like a pseudo-sequel to the Avengers than anything. Also, there's actually a bit of Dark Knight Rises in there too, so somebody's been sleeping around. The plot of Iron Man 3 takes place shortly after the events of the Avengers. However, we're now seeing Robert Downey Jr. playing a more troubled Tony Stark, and as a means of working through his stress, he's been just building more suits, putting a wedge between him and his girlfriend, Pepper Potts. Things heat up, however, when a series of bombings and TV hijackings are all linked to the Mandarin, a terrorist with ideologies that clash directly with the U.S. way of life. So despite all his personal issues and his private life potentially being in shambles, Tony Stark has to rise to the occasion, become Iron Man, and face off against the Mandarin. And if I get any more specific or go any further with the plot than that, we get into spoiler territory. So let's talk about what I can talk about. In addition to having all those suits, humor is one of Tony's main defenses, and the script is just peppered with jokes. Thanks, director and co-writer Shane Black. And if you're looking for more snarky stuff, check out his previous film, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. You will not be disappointed. Action scenes are pretty strong. However, I will say, I found myself way more invested in just Tony Stark kicking ass rather than all the times with him wearing the suit, which seems a little weird considering this is an Iron Man film, but it really gets to show off how clever Tony is. That, and I feel with the suits, that Iron Man 3 was kind of suffering from lightsaber syndrome. Yes, it's an iconic part of the franchise, but no, we don't need a million of them. Like, I get that you want to sell toys Disney, but in having more suits, I never really felt like anyone was in danger. Also, and I admit that this is a somewhat counterintuitive nitpick to my previous point, but where was S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers? Yes, I understand that the event in New York was mentioned several times, but if you've got someone like the Mandarin threatening an entire country, you'd assume that you'd want Earth's mightiest heroes to kind of stop that sort of thing. So if they are going to be present, and we are going to get Tony completely alone and stripped down of all his armor, both physically and metaphorically, all we need would be like a scene with Black Widow or Nick Fury just calling him up being like, hey, the fact that you threatened the Mandarin was kind of a dumb move because all of us are off doing this, this, and this. So you're on your own. It just seems really strange because with Iron Man 2, there was so much being set up of S.H.I.E.L.D. being a fixture of Tony's world. And the whole Marvel Universe was suddenly being built out as this big expansive thing. And suddenly none of that's there, so it feels really empty. But that said, more time with Tony Stark is never a bad time, as it allows us to delve deeper with all of his relationships. And he's playing opposite some heavy hitters. Gwyneth Paltrow and Don Cheadle return, of course. But then you've also got Guy Pearce, Sir Ben Kingsley, the kid from Insidious. Yeah, now you understand why you never see his parents. Also slightly related, much like the case with Shwarma and the Avengers, I anticipate with Iron Man 3, the sales of Dora the Explorer watches are gonna skyrocket. But yeah, that kid is really great, and everybody seems to be having a great time, and that fun translates. But you wanna know what's not fun? Spoilers. So if you want to avoid me talking the third act of this film, you best click right here so you can jump on ahead, or if you're watching on a mobile device, jump to this point on the timeline, and you'll be spoiler free. Are you done? You clicked? Great. Now, I'm not much of a comic book guy, so I didn't know anything about the Mandarin. So when it was revealed that Ben Kingsley was just an actor playing the Mandarin, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It was a misdirect that I didn't see coming and a bold one, so I have to applaud that sort of thing. But then after watching the film, I went back and did some research, being like, who's the Mandarin? And after reading up on it, I can understand why people would be disappointed. You see, the Mandarin is one of Iron Man's top enemies. He's this martial artist terrorist who happens to have 10 alien rings that grant him all sorts of crazy powers. That's a sandbox to play in as far as villains go. But I can also understand why it was done. It's probably because the Cold War's long over. And also, if you want to tap into the China market, it's probably best not to offend them with a racist character. The other reason that you could argue against having the Mandarin is because magic kind of clashes with the science that Tony Stark sort of represents. However, to that, you could provide the counterpoint that Tony's already been exposed to Thor, who's all about magic, so it's not that much of a stretch. And if we want to talk stretches, how weird was it when Guy Pierce breathed fire? Okay, let's talk some Guy Pierce in Extremis. Like, man, he's really really getting a second win playing bad guys. And in the case of Iron Man 3, he kind of gets to play two characters, as in the beginning he's basically playing Crispin Glover. Also, and maybe I'm crazy on this one, but does anybody think that Crispin Glover would make a fantastic Riddler? Or if you want to stick on the Marvel side of things, I think he'd make a great Mysterio too. But jumping back to Iron Man 3's villain, Aldrich Killian's plan is both flawed and incredibly vague. So he wants Tony Stark to perfect an algorithm that he wrote on a napkin in the 90s after a one-night stand. Which, like, right there already sounds crazy. And to do so, he ties Stark up and then injects Pepper with the Extremis Serum. Which, at this point, we've already very clearly established can make you blow up if you have a negative reaction to it. So if Pepper blows up, what does Aldrich have over Stark? Also, he's got this whole plan to kill the president so the vice president can basically be his puppet. But once he's got this puppet, what does he want him to do? We never know. I mean, I guess now the government can fund your Extremis research but creating a whole terrorist facade seems way more complicated than just filling out some forms for a grant. Although, if he did succeed in getting that puppet government, I guess that would make him 
Commander in Chief. I'll be honest, I both love and hate myself for that one. On the extremis end of things, while it is a bit silly, the heat ability is the proper challenge for Iron Man. Because if I know a thing or two, it's that steel is weak to fire. Thanks, Pokemon type chart. Doesn't read comics? Does play Pokemon. Nerd cred? Kept. What we have with Iron Man 3 is not your usual trilogy cap. It's our first step into phase two of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the film questions whether it's the suit that makes the man a hero, or if the man was a hero to begin with. Making Iron Man 3 both thoughtful and fun, but feeling a bit disjointed with some oddball tone, or occasionally some hodgepodge action, leaving me a bit ambivalent toward the film. But hey, we all have that kooky family member, right? and we love them for it. So those are my thoughts on Iron Man 3. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you want, you can check out previous reviews, like my thoughts on The Avengers or The Dark Knight Rises. And if you want to follow me on any of them social networking sites, be it Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr, or if you're looking to save some money on a movie pass, all those links are in the description. So comment, click, and keep loving movies, guys. As for me, well, Tony Stark's not the only one who can call a suit with a gesture. Nailed it.